America, the Americans carried out a top-secret investigation into the sex life of Adolf Hitler. This film tells the story of the Allies' secret sex files on the Nazis. This is London Calling. Throughout the war, all over Nazi Germany and occupied Europe, ordinary people risked punishment by tuning into the BBC's foreign service. London Calling at the beginning of tonight's broadcasting in the Africa. Its broadcasts gained a reputation for probity and objectivity, and were known in Whitehall as white propaganda. But other British radio stations were transmitting programmes based on innuendo, lies and smears. This was black propaganda. Black propaganda was so awkward, so nasty, so sly, that government didn't want to have any part in it. Didn't want to admit, rather, to having any part in it. When you think about the dulcet tones of the BBC and the, and uh, this is Britain calling, <laughs> it was a, it was a bombshell. <laughs> In 1943, Molly Izzard joined a covert government department called the Political Warfare Executive. She was posted to a secret location in the country, 45 miles outside London. It was a mystery to the locals. Uh, it was a total mystery. There was a, a, a Bengayan compound, which was all sealed off with a with the security bin, um, and you were hidden from the village. It now looks very dilapidated. We were told, in no uncertain manner, never to say anything about what we did, or where we did it, or who we did it with. The brigadier told me if I divulged anything at all, I'd be straight to prison for years. The Political Warfare Executive was an offshoot of the top-secret Special Operations Executive. Both organizations had secret agents operating behind enemy lines. But while the SOE's job was sabotage, the PWE's role was subversion. Its brief was to destabilize any area under enemy control and ultimately to produce revolutions among the subject peoples and complete loss of faith in the Nazi hierarchy on the part of the Germans themselves. The PWE used a variety of techniques to disseminate its black propaganda. Gustav Siegfried I was one of its most extraordinary and imaginative creations a covert radio station purporting to come from inside the Third Reich. In fact, its headquarters were here, in the Rookery, a large private house in the Hertfordshire village of Aspley Guys. The first program hit the airwaves on May 23, 1941, and focused on a remarkable event that had taken place earlier that month. His name is David McClay. He saw Rudolf Hess coming down in the darkness by parachute. But let him tell you his own story. Yes, I'm the man that captured Rudolf Hess. What did I realize at the time the important man he turned out to be? When the German deputy Führer Rudolf Hess landed in Scotland on an ill-judged peace mission, the black propagandists at the PWE seized the opportunity and went on the air for the first time. A character calling himself Der Chef began ranting and raving about Hess the traitor. He has no nerves for a crisis. As soon as he learns a little about the darker side that lies ahead, what happens? He loses his head completely and flies off to throw himself and us on the mercy of that flat-footed bastard of a drunken old Jew, Churchill. We would refer to Churchill as this drunken nigger. Uh, uh, and the 
the king was referred to as that stuttering fool on the throne, and you know the, 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 the things that you, you wouldn't uh, wouldn't expect for a moment would m sound as though it was coming from Britain. This was one of the things that made people think it really was genuinely coming from inside Germany. Der Chef purported to be a fanatic Nazi, who thought Hitler and his cohorts had gone soft. He claimed to be broadcasting from a secret radio station, somewhere inside the Third Reich. In fact, he was the creation of Sefton Delmer, the head of the German section of the PWE. Delmer had the bright idea of just simply having very dirty stuff on the air. <laughs> and that, that would be soon talked about and people would uh, think of uh, ways in which they could uh, spread the word around. The pornographic material did not, of course, was not, of course, aimed at the officer class. That was aimed at ordinary soldiers and sailors, who it was thought had um, an ordinary man's interest in sex and an ordinary man's capacity to be fascinated by sexual detail. But this was not meant for officer types at all. The black broadcasts aimed to sow the seeds of doubt and resentment in the minds of the frontline troops. The PWE would weave stories of corruption and incompetence in with the bawdy tales about the Nazi commanding officers. Pornography was intended to make sure that they got listeners to prick their ears up and take in what the program was saying. It was mostly stories either about the private life of the high command quite often based on fact, or stories of what foreign workers in Germany were doing to the wives and girlfriends of U-boat crews and soldiers at the front. None of the PWE's pornographic broadcasts survive, but the files released to the Public Record Office contain what appear to be draft scripts for the black propaganda broadcasts. The sexologists' stories are a list of the rumoured sexual peccadilloes of Nazi party dignitaries. They're based on genuine information collected by field agents, combined with scurrilous stories designed to ridicule or undermine the integrity of the targets. Willy Bockmann is a depraved homosexual. His particular favourite, Fritz, dresses as a woman. Garmschleiter Tinnemann is a flagellant. He gets himself into the right condition by breaking a couple of canes across his maid's back. Oberleutnant Schmidt is a homo and a painter who indulges in the most fantastic orgies. Some of the material was, as noted in the files, improved. But much had a good factual basis. The PWE had a team of researchers based in Switzerland who would read the German papers and wire over any stories or details that might be weaved into the black broadcasts to give them authenticity. The important thing was to add verisimilitude. You wanted to know what the man's nickname was, and, and you used that and showed you really did know. Uh, and if you're pur purporting to be broadcasting from inside Germany, uh, there is it's essential to get these things right. Uh, so that accurate information, which you would then distort, one PWE target was Munich party boss Christian Weber. The sexologist stories noted his nickname as the Stallion of Reims. Files from July 1942 read... Christian Weber is well known for his orgies. A particular attraction this time was a large roulette wheel on which a naked girl had been strapped. Weber, drunk as usual, was acting as croupier and set the table in motion. The audience of mainly SS men sat at the ready round the table. The gentleman opposite the girl when the wheel stops then obliges. Their chef's broadcasts were so authentic, they even fooled the Americans. In 1941, the US Embassy in Berlin reported to Washington that there was an illegal radio station using unbelievably obscene language. Superficially, it is violently patriotic and is supposed by many German officers to be supported by the Wehrmacht in secret. When President Roosevelt learned it was in fact an undercover PWE operation, 
he was most amused. But in London, the government was split over the use of obscenity. One minister announced that he'd rather lose the war than win it by using the methods employed by PWE chief Sefton Delmer. They thought it was really not British. You know, you don't want to be contaminated. You know, better not to have anything to do with it. And, uh, well, if Delmer wants this vile stuff, you know, uh, let him have it, but we don't want to have anything to do with it. The prudes did not prevail. They were told that this was war with the gloves off, and the PWE was ordered to expand. In 1942, at the height of the Battle for the Atlantic, the Admiralty asked for a new radio station to attack the morale of the German U-boat crews. The PWE created Radio Atlantic Sender, which had a new and highly successful way of attracting an audience. It played jazz, which had been banned by the Nazis as decadent. So, darling, are you burnt your fiddling with the way of bands which you can pick up? And if you picked up some decent jazz, you'd listen to it. That would attract an audience. That would start by getting people interested. And they would then mix in with this a little political propaganda and a little sexual propaganda, all intended to make people believe that the high command of the U-boats wasn't any good. Admiral Albrecht is 61 and keeps Jutta Freber. Owing to his age, he is mainly a voyeur. Jutta picks up a bunch of really sex-starved U-boat men. After a hearty meal, the boys are allowed to mount Miss Freber one by one. The most successful PWE station by far was Soldatensender Calais, which broadcast to German troops occupying northern France. Lance Corporal Alphonse Schulz was a regular listener. It was effective in propaganda terms because it used the language of the soldiers, because it addressed the soldiers, it played the music that the soldiers wanted to hear, it broadcast in a language that was appropriate to the soldiers, it used the right expressions, it was familiar with their songs, it was aware of their concerns, it touched the right spot, the vulnerable spot in the mall. As usual, the station broadcast a mixture of sex and scandal about top Nazis like Robert Ley. He was the Minister of Labour, responsible for the Third Reich's war machine. Ley is generally known to be a whoring old drunk. He recently picked up a tart from La Bolle called Giselle. The PWE mounted a sustained attack on Ley. They broadcast an entirely unsubstantiated rumour that the minister received special luxury rations, even while he urged the German people to go without. Many Germans picked up on the story. One woman was sentenced to six months in prison for repeating it, and Ley was forced into making a public denial. The broadcasts were reinforced by a leaflet dropped all over Germany. It was produced by a special unit of the PWE, responsible for printed black propaganda. Marion Whitehorn was 21 when she began working as a PWE artist. We sniggered sometimes at silly things we had to do. But we did it and, and um, hoped whatever we did do was, would be successful. And if we hadn't had our hearts in it, we would have made a bad job of it. By the end of the war, Marion's unit had designed thousands of leaflets and had millions of them printed. Their work was distributed throughout the Third Reich by the most ingenious means. Many of the leaflets were smuggled into occupied Europe by secret agents. Another novel method used time-delayed drops from balloons. The leaflets were aimed at frontline troops and used authentic typeface and slang to give the impression that they were produced by German resistance groups. This was one of a series demanding how much longer. Faking resistance material was one of Marion's specialities. I actually designed this myself. 
and it, the word shaisa means shit, and these two things are S's, and they also represent the SS. And it's got, it's, it's gummed at the back, and these were sent out by the million. <laughs> the spies took them and, and stuck them on, onto whatever, and the backs of, of people, and goodness knows where it all went. As in the radio broadcasts, the artists weren't bashful about using sex. Several explicitly pornographic leaflets were produced. At the end of the war, the government ordered the PWE to destroy them. But despite their efforts to sanitize history, some rare examples escaped. Playing on the racial prejudice imbued in ordinary Germans by Nazi propaganda, the slogan on the outside of this leaflet reads, Dear Fatherland, you can rest assured the foreign worker sticks it in good and hard. Thousands were distributed among German troops. Another pornographic leaflet was planned for the printing presses at the highest level of the PWE. I was asked to go to a meeting. I went there and I was ushered into a sort of boardroom and there were lots of men sitting around and they were handing around a postcard. The postcard was a picture of Adolf Hitler wearing lederhosen, traditional Bavarian leather shorts. When he got to me, the brigadier pointed at me. You, Marion, will impose a penis on this card and I looked what it was and it was Hitler. Um, Hitler with his hands folded over his trousers and the caption was what we have we hold and you're going to impose a penis on there but not too big Marion's artwork has been lost but a similar example of postcard pornography survived the war this PWE version enjoyed a very limited print run the top brass put a stop to the project. Such tactics, they believed, were simply not British. But the Americans had no such compunctions. In 1943, they undertook a top secret report that investigated Hitler's sex life. Its conclusions made the PWE's salacious gossip about Nazi bigwigs look like a children's bedtime story. America hasn't been long in implementing President Roosevelt's announcement that American troops would be sent to the British Isles. When the Americans first arrived in ration-weary Britain, they appeared to have everything a modern fighting force needed, and more. From one of the ships, American soldiers are seen chucking oranges to their British comrades down on the quay. Oranges, I said. Remember oranges? But there was one thing the Americans lacked, a secret intelligence service. So, President Roosevelt ordered a maverick hero from the First World War, General Wild Bill Donovan, to set up the Office of Strategic Services. Betty McIntosh was one of the new secret agency's first recruits. When Donovan set up the, uh, the OSS, he was counting on British help because, as we all know, the, the British were into this sort of uh, work since Queen Elizabeth's time. and. Uh, so he worked very closely with the British, which was very important to the OSS people. With help from the PWE, the OSS set up its own black propaganda unit, the Morale Operations Department. The Morale Operations were charged with doing any activity outside of the traditional military activity to upset the enemy to uh, weaken its will to resist. And we had black propaganda of all types, as you can well imagine, poison pen letters, uh, radio propaganda. Marlena Dietrich uh, spoke in German to the Germans on behalf of the OSS during World War II. Unlike their British counterparts, the Morale Operations Department didn't shy away from targeting Adolf Hitler himself. They wanted to know what made the Fuhrer tick? 
the idea that if we could only find out what made Hitler act the way he did, what, what his weaknesses were, we could then get to him through all many ways, through psychological warfare, through pe people going in and trying to kill him. And uh, that this, would, this would be the, the basis for what we could work from. At the time, Dr. Walter Langer was one of Harvard's leading psychoanalysts. In 1943, while Bill Donovan asked him to use his Freudian training to understand the workings of Hitler's mind. Walter Langer was a very reclusive, uh, introspective personality. And I found him unusual and extremely professorial, but uh, pleasant enough uh, when one finally got to relate with him uh, and broke the ice. In April 1943, Langer recruited a team of researchers to help with his analysis. Donovan had given him just four months to complete his report. They relied on two basic sources of information. Their first port of call were the shelves of the New York Library, where they consumed every written word about the Führer. But Langer wanted more than just books for his analysis. The FBI scoured America for anyone who'd known the Führer. They tracked down dozens of witnesses, including emigres, refugees, and top-ranking Nazi defectors. The resulting interviews provided Langer's most extraordinary and controversial evidence. It was a top secret undertaking, as you can well imagine. They drew on any number of sources, but it was very closely guarded and very secretive. Langer's source material and final report consists of 269 entries and runs to over 1,100 pages. An intricate index of Hitler's every personality trait was constructed. His affection for animals sits next to his anti-Semitism. His love of dumplings next to his messiah complex. As a Freudian psychoanalyst, Langer believed Hitler's sexual behavior would provide clues to his personality. There was a lot of gossip in those days concerning his uh, unusual sexual personality. And uh, that was a very large uh, aspect of the study, not all by far, but large, because uh, as is well known, sex plays an important role in the obtaining of information. So the report could have been used for blackmail? Uh, it could possibly have been used for blackmail, as well as for many other purposes. But the evidence Langer gathered about Hitler's sex life was far from consistent. Some witnesses said the Führer was a homosexual. He was described as promiscuous, perverted, and impotent. The index includes the names of women associated with Hitler. On the list are several young girls. This, according to some witnesses, was Hitler's weakness. His greatest pleasure was a girl's first seduction. Henny was 14 years old when Hitler seduced her into sexual play with him. Langer's view of Hitler's sexuality was shaped dramatically by the allegations of a group of key witnesses. One interviewee was an American film director named Arnold Zeisler. He had made movies in Germany in the early 30s. Zeisler told Langer how Hitler would often ask him to send actresses over to the Reich Chancellery. Hitler would then entertain them with stories of medieval torture methods. According to Zeisler, film actress Renata Muller became a firm favorite. In the 1930s, Hitler was Germany's most eligible bachelor. Renata, like many women, was desperate to have an affair with him. On one occasion, he's reported to have shown her how he could keep his right arm raised in a Nazi salute for hours on end without tiring. Sometimes his behavior was stranger still. In his report, Langer paraphrased what Zeisler had told him about Renata's relationship with the Führer. We have reconstructed what he wrote using his own words. 
One morning, Zeister found Mueller in a very depressed state. She told him that the night before had gone badly wrong. She had been sure that Hitler was going to have intercourse with her. They had both undressed when Hitler fell on the floor and begged her to kick him. She demurred, but he pleaded with her and groveled in an agonizing manner. She finally acceded to his wishes and kicked him. This excited him greatly, and he begged for more and more, always saying that he was not worthy. He became more and more excited, and as a final climax, masturbated before her. He then thanked her for a pleasant evening. Other witnesses also gave accounts of Hitler's sadomasochistic sexual perversions. The most important by far was a Nazi defector, Ernst Hampstengel. The Nazi who's who of 1934 lists the highest ranking members of the party. Hampstengel is listed as Hitler's foreign press secretary. Rich, urbane, sophisticated, he charmed the foreign press. But his chief role had been that of Hitler's entertainer. Very important always was his piano playing with which he at times actually resuscitated Hitler and infused fresh energy into him. Hanstengel had been a close political and personal confidant of Hitler's for over a decade. But in the mid-1930s, after a power struggle with Goebbels, he fell from grace. In 1937, he fled Germany in fear for his life. Hans Stengel offered his services to Allied intelligence. He ended up in hiding at a remote plantation house here in Bush Hill, Virginia. The Americans considered his intimate knowledge of the Führer to be unique outside of Germany. They codenamed his debriefing the S Project. The activity of my father in the S project was what might be subsumed under the heading of psychological warfare. He wrote profiles of all the leading figures of the Third Reich to give a sort of key to the Americans and the Allies as to what these people could do and were likely to do. The S project was deemed so important, it was under the personal control of President Roosevelt. In the spring of 1943, Dr. Langer secured a visit to the Bush Hill safe house and talked to the Nazi defector at length. Afterwards, he recorded what Hampstengel had told him. Hitler is shy when trying to win a woman's affection. His favorite phrase is, if you go to a woman, don't forget your whip. Hitler always carried his riding whip. The most serious affair was the one he had with his niece, Geli Raubel. It was assumed that Hitler was using Geli in an abnormal sexual way. He probably beat her with his riding whip and derived sadistic pleasure from it. Allegations about Hitler's relationship with his niece, Geli Raubel, were to feature prominently in Langer's final analysis. And since the war, historians have struggled to separate fact from fiction. Hitler's half-niece, Angela, was known as Geli. She was the daughter of Adolf's half-sister and spent her childhood in the small mountain town of Peilstein in Austria. She went to school with Anna Grubel. Gelly was simply unique. Mid, mid blonde she was, yes, yes. And she had a broad face, she was very beautiful. And she was very friendly, so friendly. She was a nice girl, yes, very nice. Gelly was very physical, the embodiment of the Nazi ideal woman. Gelly loved sports and outdoor pursuits and had a passion for rambling to the lakes around her village. And there she'd take her clothes off and go for a swim. Yes, we'd say, Gelly, it's very cold. And she'd say, I don't mind, and jump in and swim across the whole lake. Yes, yes, she was a good swimmer. 
By 1928, Gelli's mother had gone to work as Hitler's housekeeper just outside Munich. Her 20-year-old daughter went with her and enrolled as a medical student at Munich's university. The relationship between uncle and niece grew increasingly warm after Gelli moved to the city. She was relaxed, she was easygoing, um, she could tease him. Very few people were allowed to tease Hitler, who was very soon on his dignity. But with Gailey, he could laugh and she could laugh. And despite the age gap, which was nearly 20 years, they, they just got on. They could relax with each other. And the relationship started like that. While spending time with her uncle, Gailey met and fell in love with his chauffeur, Emil Maurice. When Hitler found out, he made Gelli write to Emil, breaking off the relationship. Dr. Anna Maria Sigmund has seen the letter. And she writes, My dear Emil, I love you so much, but my uncle says we are far too young and I should resume my studies and we shouldn't see each other only in his company. And then she writes, Can you imagine this? Um, I can't kiss you any longer and Uncle A will be always with us. She was only seen from that time on in the company of her uncle. They went everywhere together. They went to the theater to concerts uh, every day in the evening uh, to the restaurant. People at that time thought uh, that they were lovers. With Hitler's encouragement, Gele gave up studying medicine and embarked on a singing career. In May 1943, Walter Lange interviewed a second high-level Nazi defector. Like Hamstengel, Otto Strasser had fallen foul of the Nazi regime. He'd fled Germany in 1933. Strasser told Lange that by 1931, Hitler's infatuation with Gelli had become obsessional. She was forbidden to meet other young people, and Strasser claimed that Gelli had confided to him the dark nature of Hitler's sexual demands. She told Strasser that Hitler would make her undress and that he would lie down on the floor. Then she would have to squat down over his face where he would examine her at close range and this would make him very excited. When the excitement reached its peak, he demanded that she urinate on him and that gave him his sexual pleasure. The whole performance was extremely disgusting to her. According to Langer, the testimony of other witnesses seemed to confirm the allegation that Hitler's relationship with Gehle was far from normal. Ernst Hampstengel told Langer about a scandal that had been hushed up in 1930. Hampstengel had heard about it from the then Nazi party treasurer. He had just had to buy someone off who had been trying to blackmail Hitler. The man had somehow come into possession of a folio of pornographic drawings Hitler had made. They were depraved, intimate sketches of Geli Rabel with every anatomical detail. But if the allegations Langer recorded about Hitler's sexual perversions were sensational, other testimony was to accuse him of killing the only woman he ever loved. Munich, the capital city of Bavaria. Hidden away in the state archives is a thin booklet, the suicide register for 1931. In that year, 334 citizens of Munich shot, hanged, poisoned, or drowned themselves. Suicide number 193 is Hitler's niece, Angela Raubel. Gilly met her death in the luxury flat where she and Hitler had been living together for two years. On the night of the 18th of September, following an argument about a trip Gilly planned to take to Vienna, Hitler left Munich for a party rally. Gelli went into her room and locked the door. She wrote to a friend about an impending visit. When I come to Vienna, hopefully very soon, we'll drive together to Semmering and... Gelli's letter stops mid-word. In the morning, the housekeeper couldn't wake Gelli. She asked her husband to force the door. Gelli's body was found lying on the floor. Hitler's pistol lay on the sofa. 
the shot went through the lung, penetrated the lung. She fell forward, uh, uh, crushed her nose, and uh, suffocated and had a horrible, slow, and most painful death. On hearing the news, Hitler immediately drove back to Munich and gave a statement to the detective investigating the case. The police report still exists. He said it would have been easy for her to take the pistol since she knew where he kept his things. Her demise upset him very much since she was the only close relative he had. And now this had to happen to him. So the uncle who heard two hours before of, of this horrible uh, death of his niece had nothing more to say than it is really, I think, that this has happened to me. He thought, of course, of his political uh, career and what his political enemies uh, would make of this affair. It couldn't have happened at a worse time for Hitler. The Nazi party was on the brink of power. Der einst mit den Verantwortlichen an diesen Opfern ein unerbitterliches Gericht zu halten. The party had become the second biggest in Bavaria, but was under intense fire from the opposition press. Throughout the summer of 1931, they'd splashed stories of sleaze at the party HQ. Homosexual scandals vied for space with lurid details of whoring amongst the Nazi hierarchy. Gehly's death was further ammunition for the anti-Nazi press. Of course, the rumors started immediately, because it was, of course, an extremely atypical situation. That a niece at her uncle's, that a niece who is 20 years younger should be living at her uncle's. And he's the leader of an important party. And a little bit strange, anyway, with boots and a whip and a leather coat and also his political views. And then she kills herself with his gun. Well, OK, you can imagine that the rumors would quickly boil over. In the immediate aftermath of Gehly's death, senior party officials had raced to the scene and agreed a statement for the press. Fear of a forthcoming singing engagement had driven Gehly to suicide. But despite the best efforts of the Nazi propaganda machine, press speculation ran wild. According to the Munich Post, there was clear evidence of foul play. The nose bone of the deceased was shattered and the corpse evidenced other serious injuries. There was the claim that Hitler himself had killed her in a fight, that she was pregnant, and what's more, by a Jewish student. Hitler went on the offensive against the press coverage. He forced the Munich Post to carry a point-by-point -point retraction of the allegations. Faced with few facts, the newspapers dropped the story. But the rumors were to resurface years later. In 1943, during the course of his investigation, Langer's key witness insisted that Gehly had been murdered. Hans Stengel feels certain that Hitler murdered Gehly in a fury because she wanted to go out with other men. Ham Stengel says his main source for this information is Gregor Strasser, an intimate of Hitler's who was present when Gehly's body was found. He adds that Strasser was murdered because he knew the truth about Gehly's death. In fact, there's no historical evidence whatever to link Gregor Strasser's death with Gehly's. Strasser was killed in a power struggle between various Nazi factions in what came to be known as the Night of the Long Knives. Nevertheless, the debate about whether Hitler was involved in Gehly's death continues to this day. This is a guesswork, one doesn't know, but I think it's almost certain that she was killed either with his consent or on his orders or by him. She had to be squeezed out and she had to be silenced because he had made various perverted and sadistic demands on her and masochistic demands on her and she she was so uncomfortable with that, that she couldn't help talking to other people about it, which meant that she was a danger to the Nazi party. 
It was clear from the doctors that, that she killed herself, that it was a suicide. We can only uh, guess uh, what happened at that time, uh, that she was unhappy, that she was uh, restrained or forbidden to, to meet young people, that she didn't take up a, a career, and so she was really uh, desperate and ended uh, her life. Amazingly, Gailey was not the Führer's only suicidal lover. 18-year-old Mimi Reiter, Hitler's first acknowledged girlfriend, tried to hang herself in 1927. Film star Renata Muller jumped to her death from the window of a Berlin clinic, and two other women intimate with the Führer made attempts on their lives. Last but not least, Eva Braun, Hitler's most famous mistress, made two suicide attempts in the 1930s. Both were hushed up in Nazi Germany, but during his investigation into Hitler's personality, Walter Langer heard about them. He believed they could be an important key to Hitler's personality. It might be well to note that Eva Braun, his present female companion, has twice attempted suicide. Gelly was either murdered or committed suicide. Rather an unusual record for a man who's had so few affairs with women. The home movies Eva Braun shot during the war are an enduring image of her relationship with Hitler. Unlike his very public affair with Gelly, it was a relationship deliberately hidden from the world. As a member of the Führer's household staff, Herbert Döring was one of the few people to observe their affair at first hand. From what I observed and experienced, Eva Braun was not happy with her relationship with Hitler. She was never happy. You could see it. She was bad-tempered, dissatisfied, indignant, grumpy, as we say in Bavaria. In his report, Walter Langer wrote that Hitler's affair with Eva was not exclusive, noting he has also seen a good deal of two movie actresses. One of the actresses was Leni Riefenstahl. Langer heard allegations that Hitler was so timid that she had to take the sexual initiative. But Riefenstahl denies any physical relationship and has said that Hitler wasn't her type. While the Führer hosted glamorous receptions, Eva was kept out of sight. Actors, theatre people, everything, singers, they'd all be invited for dinner. He liked to surround himself with beautiful women. He appreciated that very much. Eva Braun always became terribly angry. She would sometimes ring and the servants would say, we can't connect you to the Führer, miss, he's with his guests. And she would get terribly angry because she was sitting here alone and he was with all these people. In 1932, Eva Brown made her first suicide attempt. She took her father's gun and shot herself over the heart. Hitler visited her in hospital and spoke to the medical staff. And he said, ah, did she really want to kill herself? Was it not, not uh, just uh, pretended? And when the doctors uh, told him, yes, it was a serious effort, well, uh, then uh, he liked it very much. For a while, Hitler seemed more attentive, but it didn't last. I am mortally unhappy again, and since I haven't permission to write to him, this book must record my lamentations. Fragments of Eva's diary still exist for a short period of 1935. Certain passages give a hint of their sexual relationship. He needs me for certain purposes. It can't be otherwise. And she's reported to have complained privately to a friend I've had absolutely nothing from him as a man. On the 28th of May, 1935, Eva tried to kill herself again. Her diary entry is blunt. I'll take 35 pills. That will make him see. She was discovered just in time. Unable to face another scandal, Hitler set her up in secret and gave her an allowance. Langer noted that Hitler bought her many things, including high-powered automobiles and a house in the country. Walter Langer completed writing his top-secret report in late summer 1943. It had taken him just four months. On the basis of the evidence he had gathered, 
Combined with his clinical experience as a psychoanalyst, he concluded that Hitler suffered from an extreme form of masochism in which the individual derives sexual gratification from having a woman urinate or defecate upon him. From Lange's Freudian perspective, this sexual perversion was at the heart of Hitler's madness. In his report, he argued that it caused Hitler an intense self-loathing, which his subconscious turned into an aggressive hatred of other nations and races. When it was finished, it was an extensive volume, which was seen by very few people, but most particularly seen by the President of the United States and by the Prime Minister of Great Britain. Churchill apparently found the report fascinating, and Roosevelt personally congratulated Walter Lange. But by then, the course of the war was changing. Rommel had been defeated in North Africa, and the German army had suffered a series of major setbacks on the Eastern Front. The Allies felt an all-out military victory was only a matter of time. Walter Lange's report had become redundant. His psychological analysis of Adolf Hitler remained locked away in OSS files for over a quarter of a century. When it was finally declassified, one or two reputable historians accepted its conclusions as valid, but most dismissed its findings. There is no historical evidence, whatever, for perversions of any kind. Uh, they usually can be traced back to his uh, uh, political enemies. I agree that you have to distrust the evidence of people who had been Nazis and who had turned against Nazism and were very willing to oblige the people who were asking questions by producing evidence that one must suspect but to dismiss all of it as phony would, would be absurd. I'm a historian and I, I'm not a psychiatrist, but it seems that his private life was uh, quite normal. There were no sensations, whatever. Stories about sadism, masochism, and unsavory sexual practices. Not all these stories can be untrue, particularly when you get witnesses, different witnesses, telling the same story. Whether or not Walter Langer's more sensational conclusions are true, he did show remarkable psychological insight in one respect. At the end of his report, he considers how the war might end for the Fuhrer and suggests a range of possibilities. Hitler may die of natural causes. The German military might revolt and seize him. He may be assassinated or go insane. But at the end of the list, he made a startling prediction. Hitler might commit suicide. This is the most plausible outcome. Not only has he frequently threatened to commit suicide, but from what we know of his psychology, it is the most likely possibility. In all probability, however, it would not be a simple suicide. He has much too much of the dramatic for that. And since immortality is one of his dominant motives, he would stage the most dramatic and effective death scene he could possibly think of. Walter Langer wrote those prophetic words nearly two years before Hitler and Eva Braun killed each other in a dramatic suicide pact as Germany collapsed around them. And for more information on the story covered in tonight's programme, click on to Secret History on the Channel 4 website. Now this week in Hidden Love, Grey Abandon reveals why age is no obstacle when it comes to enjoying life's little pleasures. The sex lives of the over-60s, next, here on 4. <laughs>